Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so, yes, so I'm, I'm a member of the National Chemotherapy Board and we're just about to publish this um, good practice guideline, which is essentially about how we can help identify chemotherapy side effects in patients at the earliest opportunity. Um, and there's a whole group of us that have worked on this and it will be um, released within the next month and available on, on the Yukon's website. So, um, do many people know what about the National Chemotherapy Board? Have you heard of it? Yeah. So the National Chemotherapy Board is made up of um, a group of um, organisations essentially that are dedicated to help service, services to develop um, and maintain safe practice within their chemotherapy services. So um, it includes the UK Oncology Nursing Society and BOPA, the British Oncology Pharmacy Association, Royal College of Physicians, the Royal College of um, Radiologists for Clinical Oncology and the Royal College of Pathologists. So this is one of um, several pieces of work that we've been um, working on. And I suppose there's a, a bit more of a background to this is that um, I led on it because I've just, well, about a year ago completed my PhD and I looked at um, delayed presentation of neutropenic sepsis. So trying to understand why, as we know, patients often delay calling us when they're unwell. So understanding why that, that happens. So I'm just I'm writing a paper about that as well for uh, psycho-oncology. Um, so um, the, the sort of overview of the presentation. So we're going to talk a little bit about the background. So why we think there's a problem in terms of early identification of side effects. And then talk about this, um, this, these guidelines. We did, we originally called it a position statement. It's now called a guideline. And we'll focus very much on two approaches to help patients to manage and report their, their side effects. The first broad approach is around empowering or activating patients. Um, and that can include the use of technology. And the second approach is around proactive support for patients. So thinking first of all about the, the, the problem, so um, we all know, so um, I sat on the, the Cancer Task Force to develop the, the Cancer Task Force report and we know there's a concern, more people, it's not a concern, it's great, more people are living uh, with, with cancer, but also more people are, uh, are, are being diagnosed with cancer. So we know that one in two people born after 1960 will be diagnosed with cancer at some point in their lifetime. And this increasing sort of incidence and the availability of, of new drugs mean, means we're treating more patients. So we treat more patients and they have more lines of treatment. And we, we all know that cancer in many circumstances is becoming more of a chronic chronic illness that we treat. So we treat patients over, over many years. So yeah, more and more people being treated with oral and IV uh, treatments. And I believe that the, the number of oral drugs is increasing at a greater rate to the number of IV, IV drugs. And when patients have these drugs, they're at risk of not only debilitating side effects like nausea and vomiting, but life-threatening complications like neutropenic sepsis, <laughs> um, diarrhea and thrombosis. And we hold patients and carers accountable and responsible to actually recognize when they might the patient might be seriously ill and call us so in many instances it's up to them to decide um, and that's very difficult for people people are very distressed when they've been diagnosed with cancer and started treatment they feel unwell on chemotherapy anyway um, so to know just to know when to call um, it is a big big problem and we need to think about how we can help um, them to recognize and get these symptoms dealt with earlier so we all do this, don't we? We all give people the 24-hour the, uh, helplines and we get very frustrated with people because they don't call us on time or they might call the wrong, not the wrong person, they might not call the helpline, they might call the clinical nurse specialist or they might go to the, the GP or they might pitch up in clinic and the reason they do that is because they like to go to the person or the team that they know. That's one of the things that I found in my study so it's very, relational care is very important for patients in terms of accessing help for symptoms. So it's actually very flattering if they call you rather than the helpline, although it isn't what you want them, uh, want them to do. Um, and what I saw was patients being told off for doing that, and I found that a little bit sad, actually, because they're frightened and they, they, they feel they've got that relationship with that person. So the problem is, of course, if people delay calling, if they wait till Monday when the CNS is there, um, you know, it can cause um, 
problems in terms of um, treatment delay. So the longer someone delays, the more delayed their next treatment might be, and that can impact on uh, survival, can't it? So there's some studies that show if you delay treatments, subsequent treatments, it can affect prognosis. It increases hospitalisation. So the earlier you get on top of symptoms, the less likely someone is to have to come into hospital. They might be in hospital for less time. And of course, there's these very, these very sad occasions when people die and we feel very upset and frustrated by that because we think if only they told us earlier, we might have been able to save them. So it's actually quite um, a serious issue. And certainly in terms of neutropene sepsis, um, there was some work done that indicates around 700 people a year die of neutropene sepsis from chemotherapy, which some of it may be prevent um, not preventable, but I'm sure some of those cases are preventable. Um, every patient in my study delayed presenting with neutropenic sepsis. So, so why do they um, delay? So there's some evidence that suggests that patients who are frailer are more likely to delay, where they're confused around how severe symptoms should be to report, that they're more likely to um, delay. And this won't surprise you, I didn't want to bother you, you're so busy. And you say, please always ring us, don't, you, don't, don't worry about bothering us, but they can see you're busy. And our culture, I do it myself, my mum was unwell and uh, we needed to call someone and we both ummed and ahed about it. So it's just part of how we are, I think, that we don't like to bother, bother people. Um, and also, side effects can be underestimated. So when people start to develop some of the side effects, they might not feel that unwell and they, can, they don't really, people don't realise what they can lead to. So they start, and it's only what I saw is when people become, start to become very ill, that's when they start taking it seriously sometimes and call, call you. So you, when you talk to them, they've had these symptoms for a number of days or hours, um, but they're thinking, oh, maybe it'll go away and um, it's not, it doesn't seem that serious. But, you know, something like neutropenic sepsis, you go bang down, don't you, quite quickly sometimes. So it's quite hard to communicate that, that to people. So... So in terms of people who may be riskier for delayed pre presenting, so people who are more unwell generally, whether they've got comorbidities or um, I, I saw patients with advanced cancer in my study were more likely to delay. Um, and people who are older, and I also in my study saw people who were um, had a lower mood, lower mood. So I think there may be some, something around depression. So for neutropenic sepsis, where... Um, uh, I looked at women with breast cancer where they had experience, where they'd had a recent bereavement and were bereft, or where they had experience of someone dying from cancer, they appeared less likely to come forward quickly. Um, and part of that is people are very frightened about what this actually might do, what might happen to them, and they don't want to know about it, so they ignore it, and they try to make it go away by taking paracetamol and cooling down, etc. And then there comes a time when they can't ignore it any longer. So... You know, we can't just always rely on people to, to be, you know, think rationally and, and call us. Um, the other sort of issues really are a lack of this proactive support. So as I said, it's all about patients calling us or carers um, calling us. Um, so we know from the, the, there was one national chemotherapy patient experience survey and um, within that survey, patients, that, that we, we weren't managing side effects terribly, terribly well. We know that people feel overwhelmed by the, they can feel overwhelmed by the responsibility of managing their own treatment and reporting side effects. So it's quite hard for us sometimes to work out what's going on with someone or what we might have to do about it. And we're all experts. Um, they might not have relationships. So this is what I found, the relationships with clinicians that encourage symptom reporting. What I saw was if they didn't feel they had a relationship with somebody, they wouldn't call them. So it's very, very important. And that's what's great about nursing because that's what we do. We build therapeutic relationships uh, um, with patients. And we know that during um, chemotherapy, um, a lot of chemotherapy units can become like factories if we're not careful. So patients can feel they're being processed through a factory. And it is quite a hard thing to manage because... My unit, for example, we see up to 100 people a day. So how do you provide personalised care for all of those patients? Patients on, with cancer and on chemotherapy want to be known by you as a person with cancer, not um, the breast patient having FEC chemotherapy. 
And as we get busier, we have to be safe, don't we, and deliver chemotherapy in a safe manner, which is very important. But it's important also to have, um, we, we have a role, we're nurses, we're not chemotherapy technicians, and we have a role to support patients, you know, in emotional, practical, psychological, and spiritual ways. Um, so often um, these issues aren't addressed, and this, is, this came out of the, the task force report, often patients on treatment aren't as well supported as um, patients outside of treatment. So they may not have a, a clinical nurse specialist looking after them, for example. Um, so we know that access to a clinical nurse specialist is um, associated with better patient experience, but we know, again, that 39% of patients don't have access. So if they haven't got access to a clinical nurse specialist and chemotherapy nurses haven't got the time to support them through the treatment, who is supporting them? So that's um, risky. Um, and as I said, in my study, I saw the patients just thought we were too busy to call. So whatever you say to someone, they can see it. They can see you're busy. You can't kind of hide, hide that. And there's lots of research that, that um, has picked up that we can be, not just nurses, but doctors as well, very technically focused on the drug and the, managing the side effects on the drug, but not the person and knowing that person and supporting them in a holistic way. And if we're not able to do that in a brilliant way, that's not our fault. It may be that the infrastructure is not right or we don't have enough time. So it's about stepping back and looking at how we might change things to provide a bit more of that, that support for people. So the, the two, two approaches, the first one is this empowerment or, or activation. And the King's Fund talk about activation of patients. So it's this sort of um, empowering people to, to manage their own um, care and to take responsibility and believe that they, they can actually manage their own treatment rather than be very passive. And what I've seen is patients being very passive during chemotherapy, passive recipients of information about side effects that they have to report and maybe not a focus, enough focus on empowering them on how to manage their own, own side effects and how to know how bad symptoms should be to call. So um, the Royal College of Physicians, this was through um, the National Chemotherapy Board, um, they developed an emergency planning wallet. You can find this on the internet for um, patients going through, through treatment. And it's a wallet that helps people have information and helps them think about what, how they might act if they're unwell. Because what we don't always do is prepare people or talk through with people, well, what would you do if you're unwell? Where would you go? Who would look after your children? What would get in the way of you coming to hospital? So I saw people delaying coming to hospital even when they'd called waiting for someone to come and look after their children or people finishing work or that kind of thing. So it's, I think, something about helping people to think it is a possibility. I might have to come quite quickly to hospital. So if I had to do that, where, where would I, you know, what sort of things would I call about? You know, would, where's my local A&E? How would I get there? That, that kind of thing. So um, this is what this is, this is saying, really. There should be systematic adoption of emergency contingency planning for patients with cancer. So this should cover the likely situations that might require urgent care, plus any specific problems where prompt and correct management will be critical. Okay. So I think I've sort of talked about this. So empowerment <coughs> is about the knowledge, skills, and confidence a person has to manage their own health care. So you can activate people so move them from being passive them and their, their families and it may be that they need the family to be people when they're first starting chemo they might not be able to do it they might be so worried and frightened and distressed they might not be able to do it straight away so it may be initially working with family and you may work with them on, on a longer term basis um, so it's about partnership working um, so as I said about ongoing developing these relationships to support people to manage and report their side effects. Okay, so I've already said this, so chemotherapy information, so I saw it encouraging passivity, and Emma Reen's seen it in her, her research as well. So are you familiar, when, have you ever watched someone being consented to chemotherapy? So you go, so you can get this, you can get that, you can get that. And the patient said to me yesterday, she said, um, it was funny, she said, because when he got to the end, he said, and then you may, might die to lighten the mood, she said. <laughs> she said, because it just sounds, when you sit back and listen, it sounds awful, absolutely awful. 
So there are ways of um, delivering that information in, in other ways. So, you know, when they come to us for when we get, we're doing the pre-treatment consultation, you ask people, what are you worried about? How are you feeling about having the chemotherapy? And you can talk through some of those issues. Then there may be some things you want to talk to them about. Um, but they will not hear a list of symptoms that they have to have to report. And there's something about an ongoing dialogue with people throughout their, their treatment. So it takes people a couple of treatments to become more expert in managing. So you can't do everything right at the beginning. So the consent and the pre-treatment consultation being done before treatment starts. When people, some people cannot hear, they're terrified. So it's something about this, that's part of our role, isn't it? How we relate with people and support them on this ongoing um, basis. So that's about this. Do you just dump information, this generic information, or do you listen? So people will say, oh, I'm really, I'm a bit worried about that infection. Or I'm worried I'm going to throw up. And that's great. If they say they're worried about infection, I love that because then I can talk about how you're going to manage that. And you can empower people um, by helping them to think about how they would act. So you, you would do this and then this would happen and we'd support you through it. So you need to be in touch, touch with us. So rather than them thinking, oh, I can't do anything about that, I just won't think about it. If it happens, I'll have to deal with it then, which is what some people do. Um, so this patient activation, so the King's Fund, as I've said, they've got a toolkit around this. And it's been shown to improve adherence um, to medication and reduce any tendencies in patients with diabetes, HIV and chronic heart failure. Um, okay. So in terms of this empowerment, there's some evidence that um, tools like traffic light symptoms may help patients to report their side effects. So I'm going to show you a couple of those um, in a minute. And the emergency planning wallet, there's some evidence around that. Um, there's, there's, what we're suggesting is that the holistic needs assessment is very interesting. That's done at the start and end of treatment. And actually, people go through a lot of difficult times, don't they, during chemotherapy? And we don't we don't do that, we don't revisit that holistic needs assessment. So could that be something we as chemotherapy nurses could use um, during uh, treatment to identify and sort of address supportive care needs and to help empower um, patients? So this is a tool that I developed with a, someone called Joe Johnson. So we, it was developed for patients on oral chemotherapy. But at my trust, we've just, we're using it now for patients on all chemotherapy. It's based on the acute oncology triage tool that Philippa Jones developed for UCOMS. And the patient I was talking to yesterday, she said it was brilliant having that because, you know, I could see, oh, I'm not, you know, it gave me permission because it, we, what we've tried to do is tell people, give them some guidance. Actually, if your symptoms are this severe, you do need to call. And what she said was amongst all the information she had, this was something that she could really see could help her to, to manage her, her treatment. Okay. And this is another, uh, another tool, which I don't know if you can see, um, but that's being developed by Chambers et al. I think you'll get the slides. I get the slides. Yeah. So the other issue around empowerment, of, uh, around carers. So carers, um, what the research shows is they, they can feel ill-equipped to support um, patients to help them to recognise and report side effects. And what some of the research has shown is that we don't always engage with carers during our consultations. And there's an opportunity there to engage with them and get help them to help um, the patient. There's been a, an intervention developed by um, Vicky Tazaniki with Emma Reem, which is a, an education um, session for carers with a DVD and a book specifically for carers of patients on chemotherapy. And it increased their um, self-efficacy in terms of their beliefs in their ability to help people report symptoms. Um, but again, it's very important because not everyone has a carer. So I would identify that as a risk if you've got someone on treatment and they could become unwell. If they're quite isolated, they may be a riskier person who needs more support. Um, so the other um, part of this is around um, technology. So um, there's various sort of studies. There's one study in America that used technology to help patients. So patients, this, these sort of um, studies, they use devices where patients put their symptoms into a device. 
and it would trigger an alert to a clinician if a symptom went red for it, orange or red for example and then it would be a nurse the nurse would call the patient back it all they also generate self management advice so if it's symptoms that don't need our intervention it'll give them some advice on how to manage those symptoms which is quite empowering isn't it because you're giving them tips to do that um, so the other system that's a UK based system developed by Nora Kearney um, and it's now sitting at um, Surrey University is the ASIM study so it's that kind of study and this is a massive study that's now gone um, European wide and it's shown so far with the first 300 patients that they find it simple to use, it improves their confidence in recognising symptom patterns, um, it improves communication with clinicians and it detects serious side effects earlier. Um, and there's another tool called the, the Q-Tool Q which um, apparently has similar impact. So just moving on to the, the second approach which is around proactive monitoring. So acute oncology a lot of it is around, so patients call into acute oncology and then they, the, the service might phone them back a few times, but this is talking more about being a bit more proactive about patients who may be <coughs> riskier or calling people, or monitoring people at specific times. So what we know is that home monitoring, so home visits during chemotherapy reduce hospital admissions and uh, were found to be cost, cost neutral. We know that proactive support is most effective around the first two treatments because it takes two couple of treatments for people to become um, experts in their care. Um, the studies suggest that proactive support prevents symptoms escalating, so they're dealt with much, much earlier. Um, there's more evidence really needed to, to, um, to, to look at this issue to actually fully say that this is the case, but the evidence is suggesting that is the case. Um, so we need to understand the cost effectiveness of these kinds of services in terms of if you're you know, reducing admissions, etc. Because they've been shown to be cost neutral so far, but obviously the, the, the patient experience was much better. Um, so we need to learn more about cost effectiveness and optimal timing of these kinds of interventions. Um, so within our, guide, our guidelines, we've got some recommendations at the end. So um, we, 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 we suggest that chemotherapy providers look into introducing health needs assessments within um, nurse leg SACT consultations, so to, to <laughs> use the, um, that tool within those consultations, to assess carer status, so to be very aware of what sort of support people have, um, provide specific education opportunities for carers, because if someone's so I've seen people collapse with neutropenic sepsis and carers not knowing what to do because they hadn't been at the pre-treatment consultation or someone taking to their bed and the husband went down the pub because he didn't know what neutropenic sepsis was or that might be what was wrong, wrong with her. So it's very important where we can to involve carers to educate them and we think to think about some additional proactive support for higher risk people without carers. There's also something about training to conduct consultations with patients for nurses. So we're not trained to conduct pre-treatment consultations. We sort of, there's no specific training for that. And it's of what I've seen and what a lot of the literature says is that often it can be this very sort of information delivery. Um, so it's about how you develop skills to be more interactive and these motivational techniques that you can use to help empower people to, to, to take this responsibility. Um, and you can quite do quite simple things to get people to start taking responsibility for their, their, their treatment and to feel they've got some control over it. So an example would be um, a patient I was in clinic last week. He was very sort of low and, you know, monotonal about you know, when he was talking to me about his treatment and he said, oh, I go to the gym every day. I don't suppose I can exercise. And in our hospital, the physios provide one-to-one -one advice. And I said, oh, would you like to talk to the, video, the physio? And his whole demeanor changed. He was really pleased because he could see, oh, he could do some exercise during treatment. So it sort of was empowering him um, to manage his own treatment. Okay. Um, so look into tools like the, the King's Fund activation tool that you can find online. Um, ensure patients and carers, if they'd like access to things like the traffic light system, to make those available 
to people. And Macmillan actually, um, they have an, I think they have an app about symptom reporting. So you might want to look at that. Um, and in terms of patient calling, um, we, we were, within our document, we talk about developing and evaluating individualized risk-based protocol development approaches to um, plan proactive calling. So that's thinking about regimens where we think people might need a bit more calling or individuals who might need a bit more calling. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to always be chemotherapy nurses. We can look at how we work with clinical nurse specialists as well. So in my trust, our lung nurses, they phone patients on chemotherapy just because they're so un unwell. Um, so they, they do regularly um, phone their patients. And any evaluation should include a cost-benefit analysis. So it's about um, you know reducing morbidity and mortality, improving the patient experience, but also we have to be realistic that something is cost cost effective. Um, so just to, to finish, so recommendations for future research. Um, so there's more research to look at the impacts of these potential um, self management tools, how they might help patients report symptoms earlier. Um, explore benefits of this holistic nursing approach, so looking at um, the way chemotherapy nurses work and maybe doing something different and seeing what impact that has. Um, identifying more patient or disease specific factors for delayed reporting. We don't know enough, I, I don't think, about individual factors that might affect reporting. We need a randomised controlled trial to determine the effects of home care or proactive calling um, on hospital admissions, morbidity and mortality, because it looks like the, the, the most effective intervention was the home monitoring, visiting patients at home, but that's quite expensive. So if you could show you could do something of similar effect by calling people, you could obviously support more, more patients. We need to determine the optimal timing for proactive monitoring. So we call patients the day after they start treatment at the moment because we know that people have questions then because when they start their chemo, they sort of relax and they might not have heard everything you've said. Um, but should you call all patients at day seven, day 10 of the first cycle, we don't, we don't really, really know. Um, and uh, yeah, to understand patient preferences for different ways of supporting them. Um, so proactive calls, community health work uh, visits, or techn technological approaches. So I thought with the tel you know the telephone type devices that older people wouldn't like it, but apparently that isn't the case. That they they do do use it and they do like it and find it uh, reassuring. So that's my presentation. <laughs> Right, and it's it's really. Um, I think whenever I hear you talk, it always makes me really think. Yeah, that's why we're nurses. Mm -hmm. It's about providing relational care. That's what yeah. we do. That other health professionals perhaps don't. They don't have the opportunity. We have that ongoing contact. So, yeah. so that you know, that's that's what we're there for. So, um, thanks for that's sure, okay. you know really highlighting that today. So, are there questions for Catherine? Catherine, you were talking about motivational interviewing to um, help with the sort of information giving for patients on SACT. Yeah. Um, when you were doing your work, did you come across health coaching or cognitive behavioural therapy techniques as well? So I'm aware of them. So in my study, I was looking at why people don't report their symptoms. So my next study is the intervention. So, yeah, so I'm aware of these sorts. They do lots of different approaches, but we're not trained in them. <laughs> And I actually think when, when I observe, so pre-treatment consultations, if you ask someone what's worrying them, they, they might say, I'm going to die, which they might be going to die. And some of the junior chemo nurses, that's quite, they, you got, you, you've got to be able to deal with those. And it's all entwined in, in the chemotherapy. So when people start chemotherapy, I, it heightens their fear of dying. So it's a complex intervention that we don't have enough training for is what I think. We've actually, I've, I've been trained in health coaching. I've actually got an MSc student doing a pilot study oh, right. looking at health coaching yeah. and its impact on oral anti-cancer agents. Yeah. And um, I've got colleagues in the AHSN that are looking at cognitive behavioural therapy. Yes. And we're going oh, to look right. at having a cohort of um, farm, cancer pharmacists being trained to do yeah. that as well. Yeah. Yeah. We should talk to you then. Yeah, we're good. We're good to <laughs> yeah. The yeah. 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 Um, 
Catherine, you, you highlighted another really important point about um, patients living on their own. Yes. Or, or patients, um, you know, often family members will be the main carers and you might have a really proactive spouse, for example, and that's great. Yeah. But I think it is also about assessing what family setup people have got, what support mechanisms they've got. Yes. And I think I get a sense that often we don't do that or we're making assumptions. So what are your kind of thoughts about that? So I think I think you're right. You need to know who's who's around and whether they want to support or able to support the person. Because even if someone's living with somebody, it doesn't mean they'll want to support them. But what I find quite sad is that we have. So in our letter now, we um, we for our pre-treatment consultations, we say please bring the person who lives with you to the if there is somebody to the consultation because what I saw was them not coming. <coughs> And again, that's that's a whole new study about why. So I saw women excluding men, which is quite interesting. They'd rather bring their friends for, for moral support who live nowhere near them, so the men didn't know what. To. But I think if there are families that want to be involved, it's a bit of a shame if they're not there. That's such an important consultation. But you're right, it's actually understanding the dynamic. So I had yeah a, a case a couple of weeks ago where someone came with the patient and they live with the patient and they've now got the patient's just started treatment and they've gone on holiday and then another family member called me. There's this whole dynamic going on about that we need to understand because actually she's not that well supported even though she lives with somebody. So we sort of assumed that that family would be there for her. So yeah, it's it's complex, isn't it? Families are complex, yeah. and we we assume oh they want to, you assume someone wants to care for that person, and often they do, but they or they might just find that it's the responsibility and carers feel it this sort of pressure, and especially something like chemotherapy, they don't know much about it to feel because when someone can't do anything about their symptoms, that carer is going to have to call. Um, and one of the things I do is I I say I say could you if the carer is there can I give the card to I say can I give the card to Verna if you were ill would you be happy for Verna to call us so I'm hoping and the patients always go yes yeah, so, yeah, so, I mean, sort so, of, so when I talk about I always talk about family inclusive care I think it is really important to you know, ask the family can we can we support them and how can we do that yeah yeah exactly. The question was just, just on a practical level. Um, yeah. Do you see all your new patients before they come for their first treatment, or who sees them? You know, I didn't. You just talked about oh, pre-treatment so pre -treatment consultation. Yeah. So that, in our trust, so the patients get consented by a doctor, and then a pre-treatment consultation is done by a nurse in the so day. The same day at that time. It's not at the same okay. day, but it's always before the treatment starts. So all of your patients who come in, all your hundred patients a day, will be seen. For the, before this their is first before treatment. the first. Yeah, before the first treatment. Before the first That's treatment. Impressive. Yeah, so they all have a pre-treatment consultation. Yeah, yeah I, I, and think it must be. I think it must be very helpful. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if you do it in the right way, yeah, 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 it is very helpful. But I mean, you're in London, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. So that's not that's people can manage the two trips. You know, in our in where we are in Oxford, it's, it's yeah. difficult to get. You know, yeah. we have a difficulty getting people yeah. to come. Well, I don't say we've got difficulty, yeah. but it's seen as a real big ask to ask people to come twice. Although I don't think it is personally. Well, myself. I think it's very important. Yes, I would agree. And with it, but patients can they get a lot? Yeah, yeah. Does, does everyone do a separate nurse? Who does a separate nurse pre-treatment consultation? I know not everyone <coughs> does it, but the patient. I mean, I in my nurse clinics, I consent and I do a combined consent and pre-treatment consultation. Because I and it's, there's a lot of repetition, so I do it, I do it all together, and that works quite quite well. But we do something different. We provide different. A different we have a different interaction, and the patient. Well, you know, they'd ask you different questions than they'd ask a doctor. And we we've got more. We can be more empowering um, in terms of you know helping people to yeah, manage. I, I mean, I, can we still have relationship care? Yeah. Well, I yeah, I. I did one over the telephone because they they couldn't they couldn't come, and it was a guy and his sister, and it went really well. And I went so the things you can do for yourself is you can do this for your skin, this to you get diarrhea, and they were, I could feel them thinking oh, and she was right. I could see she's hit, but actually Skype, you could do a nice Skype 
but it's I think it is it that's a really good idea but it's what is what is your service specification so what is important within your service and you know when you go for when patients go for hip replacement they have a class don't they and they have to go it's yeah. very important part of their recovery so I would say the same about this but I do think there's too much repetition so if nurses can do the consent and the pre-treatment consultation that's a lovely because the doctors can give the information to start with and then they can come back and you can do that. And I think the final thing about the face to face, I'm very touchy feely, anyone that knows me knows that I'll be on a big case. Um, there's something that nourishes me about seeing a patient in physical contact, so I think it's also recognising what we get out of it as yeah. yeah. our patients, right? So I think that's something that's when we factor into that, that, yeah. that relationship. It's not just the patients getting something out of it, we do too, yeah. we physically see them, so how we would manage that. Yeah, because patients are very grateful and they, they sort of get hold of you and hug you and, you know, they're just so grateful that someone, that they've had a chance to just explore their concerns and, you know, you've just give, you've pre prepared them to, to go through this and to support them through this treatment. They just want you to help them get them through it, don't they? So, okay, one question, we've got yeah. Sorry, um... We, at the moment, do pre-chemo chats um, before, like yourself, but there is a talk of doing sort of group pre-chemo yes. chats um, to do with site-specific or a lot of people having the same treatment. Does anyone else do that, and does it work? Because we quite like doing the individual ones at the moment, but I just Alan, wanted to... do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I come from um, Swinton, and we've tried the group sessions, and um, we try grouping patients together with the same treatment, same diagnosis, etc. But what we've... No, they weren't willing to ask those questions. And although we may have an hour, an hour and a half group session, we then spent the next two or three hours doing small individual sessions to mop up all the bits and pieces. So actually, it, we found that it really didn't work, no matter what combination we tried. They can also be um, like lecturing, yeah. and that's patients hate it. It's just like it's, just, it's similar to the tick box. So I've told, I've, I've, I've offloaded all this. I've, I've, you know, I've told you all this. So I've done my job. And so it, you've got to be careful the way you do that. But I think that there is a possibility it could be, it could work, but we'd have to think very carefully about. Lovely. Thank you. Okay, Thanks thank again. you. Sorry for overrunning.